Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Onco Daily and the Onco Influencers. And today is a great privilege and honor for me to welcome Dr. Pasi Yane. And previously, in the last in the last session, we were interviewing Lilian Siu, and uh, I asked her who I should interview next. And without any hesitation, she said, "You certainly need to uh, talk to Dr. Yane." And here we go. Thank you very much for having the time for us and for kindly and promptly uh, replying to our request. Um, My pleasure. I'll just, thank you. I'll just briefly introduce you uh, for our um, for our, our auditorium. Also, I, I'm sure majority knows you very well, but uh, just briefly. Dr. Pasi Yane received his MD and PhD from the uh, University of Pennsylvania in 1996. He completed postgraduate training in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and in medical oncology at Dana Farber in 2001. And he is the senior vice president for translational medicine and the scientific director of the Belfer Center for Applied Cancer Science, as well as the director of Chen Huang Center for EGFR Mutant Lung Cancers at Dana Farber Cancer Institute. He's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. His main research interests include studying the therapeutic relevance of oncogenic alterations in lung cancer. He was one of the co-discoverers of uh, EGFR mutation that has led to the development of therapeutic strategies for patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer. He received numerous awards and distinctions, among them Outstanding Investigator Award from the National Cancer Institute, Translational Research Award from ESMO, and uh, Wang Ki Hong Award from Outstanding Achievement in Translational and Clinical Research from ACR, uh, Merit Award from ASCO, and uh, most recently Medal of Honor from the American Cancer Society. I can read for like an hour, but let's stop it here. Uh, Dr. Yanne, uh, when I asked Lillian Su, as I mentioned, uh, she mentioned that I should interview you next. Why? What do you think? I don't know, probably because of our work in the targeted therapy space. As, as you mentioned, we've been involved in the EGFR mutation, uh, you know, studying patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer ever since the discovery that we're involved in and trying to develop new and novel therapies and ther therapeutic approaches uh, for this uh, uh, population of patients. And I, I'm happy to say that over the last uh, several years, I think, uh, outlook for patients newly diagnosed with EGFR mutant lung cancer is better than it was before. We have uh, uh, um, osimertinib as the uh, approved and commonly used uh, first, uh, the third generation EGFR uh, TKI that's used in the first line setting. And most recently the FLORA2 trial adding chemotherapy to osimertinib showing that it led to an improvement in progression-free survival compared to osimertinib alone. So I do think that therapies are better and getting better for uh, patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer, although we still have work to do. Not everybody benefits from the therapies and there are subtypes of EGFR mutant lung cancers like the exon 20 insertions, which have been very challenging to treat, but even there, there are new therapies coming uh, to the clinic, which is uh, wonderful to see. Thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, Papa Nicolau, uh, Joe Biden, George Bush, and now it's you, uh, 2024 American Cancer Society Medal of Honor. And this is the highest honor of the society. I mean, what you would like to say about it? Well, first of all, I'm honored and hum humbled to be amongst the group of recipients uh, 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 of this uh, wonderful honor, and also honored that my colleagues uh, in the field of oncology think highly enough of me to be considered uh, for, and, and for what the work we've done to be considered for this, uh, this, uh, this award. And so I think it's, uh, uh, I was really honored and thrilled to have received that. And uh, I think uh, also provides inspiration to continue to do the type of work uh, that we've been trying to do to continue to develop uh, new and novel strategies for uh, patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer, be it new and novel drugs themselves or new and novel combination therapies, uh, like I mentioned, the, the, the FLORA2 study. So 
uh, it's, it's, it, it, was, it was a wonderful honor for sure. Thank you. In 2022, in your interview to OncLife, you said that the most important thing about a master plan is not having one. Can you explore it a bit more? I think you, um, I think um, things happen and you have to, I think uh, you, it's hard to always plan what the, all the next steps are going to be. And sometimes you have to uh, kind of understand where research, be it clinical research, scientific research is going and where there may be opportunities for new discoveries or new therapeutic approaches and things like that. Um, so I think that's what I was trying to say that, that and, and also for our trainees who are finishing their training and entering the early phases of their careers, sometimes, um, sometimes you get involved in projects that you never even planned to be involved in, and they may lead you to new and novel directions. And uh, uh, if you try to pre-plan too extensively, you may miss those opportunities. Um, and um, so I think it's good to keep an open mind on how things evolve and the kind of work you're doing and uh, wh where the directions and opportunities may arise uh, as, as part of that, as opposed to trying to fit it into some predefined path because we're not very good, I think, at predicting exactly what's going to happen in the future. Uh, please, can you talk about your childhood, about your family? Your father was a biologist. Uh, what yes. was the main... Yes. Most so I, I'm, I'm, I'm from uh, Finland originally, and I Grew up in Finland till I was 12 and then moved to uh, the U.S. and grew up in New York City and went to high school in New York City and have been on the East Coast of the United States uh, since then. I went to college north of New York City at Vassar College and then did my MD, PhD at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and have lived in Boston now where I uh, came to initially do my internal medicine training, but then on college training have lived here for now 25 years or so. And so uh, I enjoy the environment here where I'm, I'm working. I'm fortunate to be able to run a research laboratory and also be able to take care of lung cancer patients and, in, and run, uh, conduct and enroll patients into therapeutic uh, and translational clinical trials. And we try to address questions in the laboratory that we feel are clinically relevant and clinically important and then try to ask if those are relevant if, if those strategies are potentially relevant by conducting clinical trials and 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 also learn from the clinical trials why they can be successful and why they may why new therapies or new therapeutic approaches uh sometimes are not successful is it a toxicity issue is it a lack of efficacy issue is it a combination of both and then use that as a way to refine uh, treatment strategies. So, uh, are, are you keeping still contact with Finland? Yes, my parents live in Finland, and uh, I do, uh, and, and I have other family members that live in Finland, and I do go to Finland a few times a year, so. Nice. Uh, what about New York? I, I mean, you studied there, you started U.S., like from the New York, What's the most significant there? What you like about New York? I, I I'm a big city person. I like big cities, and New York, uh, you know, is uh, alive twenty four hours a day. So I like that about New York. You can, you know, it's uh, there's lots of things to do, a variety of things from cultural things to restaurants to other things. It's a it's a wonderful place, and it's it's alive. And uh, I like that about big cities. Boston isn't quite there yet, although I do like living in Boston. Uh, but uh, uh, but I, I I enjoyed growing up in New York City, and I enjoy visiting New York City every 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 chance I get. Uh, you know, I mean, if someone wants to visit New York, like top three things they should explore it or they should do. What's your recipe? Uh, Going see things like Times Square and Rockefeller Center, Metropolitan Museum of Art, for sure. It's fantastic. And um, finding a wonderful restaurant to eat. 
So I think New York pizza. Uh, pizza, pizza is good too. New York pizza is good, but there's many other good, uh, good uh, food opportunities there as well. So, which one is the most, the best one you would recommend? What's your favorite? Uh, I don't know. It depends on what your taste is. You know, I think the good For thing New York is. Pizza. That, I don't know that I have a favorite pizza place. It's been a while since I had pizza in New York, but uh, uh, I think the good thing about New York is that there is. Um, doesn't matter what your background or interest is, there is usually something that fits that just because of the diverse and vast nature of the city. So you started at Vassar College, right? Yes. I mean, and it's known for like many celebrities there, like famous people. What impact it had on you? Well, Vassar is a liberal arts school. So I was a little bit of a outcast studying chemistry in a liberal arts college but uh i enjoyed the experience there in the sciences and also got exposed to things like art history which uh the school is much more known for but it, it gave me a, a, a appreciation for things outside of science as well i was able to focus on science um which helped me get to the next phase of my career but i was also exposed to many other things outside of science which i thought was wonderful and it was a wonderful place to go to school north of New York City. What is more the most important for you in the science? In in what way? I mean, for a scientist or just in the science, what's the most important for you? I, I think for a science, I think for a scientist, um, you know, we try to. I think we try to find the truth to some degree is what science is about, and. Hopefully that ultimately has impact. And so as a scientist, being able to make impact into medicine, which I've fortunately been able to uh, do that uh, 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 in my career is, 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 is truly a wonderful experience to see that something that you've been involved, involved in scientifically actually helps or has an impact in a, in a human being that's suffering from cancer in, in, in my in my specific situation, I think is a wonderful, uh, wonderfully gratifying uh, 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 thing to have experienced. Uh, why lung cancer and why oncology in general and why lung cancer specifically? So oncology, I, 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 as you mentioned, I trained in medicine and in science and I have a PhD in genetics and I, wanted to find a career after medical school or a path, you know, that would be able to combine those two medicine and science, the genetics background. And I thought that that would be probably better achieved in hematology and oncology than, for example, neurology or cardiology, at least at the time when I was finishing my training, things may be different now. And uh, so I trained in hemato or in oncology, and then I got interested in studying lung cancer as a disease. I was interested in medically. It still is, a, unfortunately, still at the time when I entered the field and still now, it remains the number one cause of cancer death for both men and women in the United States. So we've made some impact collectively in the disease, but there's still, uh, still a ways to go. And... Um, and uh, uh, when I was deciding about uh, what I wanted to do, I was, I was interested in the disease. I was interested in the sort of multidisciplinary nature uh, of, the, of the disease. And I also found a very good mentor, uh, Bruce Johnson, to work with, which was an important piece for somebody early on in their career to have a mentor who would guide him or her. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and Bruce did that for me. So all of those things kind of came together. And then... Uh, I've stayed in that space ever since. Uh, can you explore more about your mentors and the role of mentorship in your opinion in uh, in medicine and in oncology well, I think, particularly? I, I, I think mentorship is important. Mentors help guide you in your specific projects. They uh, help guide you in, uh, uh, you know, uh, in uh, things like grant applications, manuscripts, et cetera. And, and they also help make connections for you and open doors for you and introduce you to people in the field or in my case, and, and also, or introduce you to um, 
uh, specific companies that may be working on new drugs that you may be interested in studying you know, preclinically or clinically. And so I think they really uh, provide important career guidance. And um, I still have mentors. I still go to my mentors and ask them uh, um, questions and advice and things like that. So I think uh, it's really a lifelong process. And I'm uh, happy to have been able to be on the giving end of that and being able to mentor uh, uh, young uh, oncologists and scientists as well. So it's a it's really a, it's really a critical component of uh, of a career development. You can't do you can't do this all on your own. You need you need you need mentors and people who can help with help guide you and uh, direct you. Uh, thank you. Um, talking about mentees. For example, I, I'm sure a lot of young professionals are going to watch this interview. And what would be your advice if someone wants to be your mentee? What they should do? First of all, they should come and talk to you if they want to be your mentee. You may want to ask them about their mentorship style, how they mentor individuals, how have they mentored or give them examples of successful mentees that they have had and where they may be at the moment. Uh, for example, if you're interested in academic, staying in academic medicine, you can ask your prospective mentor how many mentees that they have had that have stayed in academic medicine or where are they now? Are they in university settings or in industry or government agencies or, or, or whatnot? So it depends a little bit on what you're, what you're interested in long term. Now, sometimes it's hard to plan that, but uh, it's good to get some sense from the prospective mentor as to how that's happened in the past and where his or her prior mentees are at the moment. I think that's an important, important piece. And uh, your wife, uh, Karen, Karen Sikowski, right? If I pronounce yes. correctly, she's a cancer biologist, well known and head of, uh, she has her own lab. And again, uh, she's at Harvard Medical School, a professor there. I mean, how is it at home, like uh, two professors from Harvard Medical School at home? <laughs> How are you? Well, kids I, I don't know. I think, uh, it, you know, there's obviously tough times, you know, uh, writing grants, papers, you know, there are times that are busier than others. Uh, we hope that uh, we've uh, set a good example for our children about uh, what it takes to be uh, successful in your career. Um and um but it's 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 been uh it's been good i think we have a understanding of each other's needs and you know what happens that you know what you know sort of why there may be times of less busy or busy at work and what are the what are the challenges and deadlines that we all have to deal with because we're in similar similar fields what are your children doing my son, who is the older one, is a, a graduate student at University of Michigan in engineering and in robotics specifically. And my daughter is a sophomore in college at Notre Dame University. So they're studying psychology. So um, so they're, they, they have found their ways and, and they have found what they're interested in, which we're uh, both my wife and I are very happy about that they found something that they're interested in, want to pursue as a career, and we are looking forward to see how how that all evolves and are continually giving them thoughts and advice uh, as to uh, how to how to navigate that space. Uh, you play hockey, right? And yeah. you and you raise also money for charitable purposes through playing hockey. I mean, can you explore this story for our? Yeah, our well, way? of course, uh, of course, being from from Finland, you know, we have a tradition of uh, uh, of hockey, and hockey is probably the most popular sport there. And I uh, have played as an adult uh, now for uh, uh, for over a decade. I, I played as a kid when I was growing up in Finland, but then after moving to the U.S., I didn't. And then my son started playing hockey when he was young, and I, I kind of got involved in that and then that got me interested in playing in as adult and now I play as an adult a few times a week and I really enjoy it it's a good camaraderie it's a good exercise it's really fun 
Uh, and, and in a place like Boston, you can play year round. It's not limited just to the winter. There are places open in the summer and I play in the summer. So it's really fun. Yeah, Boston is beautiful. It is also one of my favorite cities. I agree. And you like also wine and good food, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's your favorite in terms of wine and food? Depends where I am. And uh depends where I, I always look forward to opportunities when I travel to find places to eat uh eat with uh my friends and colleagues in the in, in the field. And uh 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 we we always make a point of doing that uh at every uh meeting that we're together. And uh so that's uh that's fun. It's a good way to share company and and and, and conversation over uh over over food and 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 wine. So it's a and 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 of course we do that at home as well. So I can promise when you come to Armenia, you will not be disappointed, both for the wine and for the food. Okay, well, yeah. I look forward to that. I've never never been to Armenia and would love to visit at some point. Yeah, we will organize certainly. Uh and if you if you write your most short bio, let's say in three sentences, how you would write it? How would I write my bio? Um hmm. I guess uh, it's a translational medical oncologist, uh, ASEAN is a translational medical oncologist focused on improving uh, the lives and outcomes of patients with lung cancer. Wonderful. Uh, in your opinion, what's the future of oncology? In 10 years, how it's going to look like? And is like, what about AI? Is it going to take over or? Uh, I think it, AI can uh, be helpful in oncology. I don't know that it'll necessarily take over oncology, but I think there are applications to AI, like uh, uh, in, in, for example, radiology, you know, analyzing scans or pathology that can help the uh, pathologist uh, with throughput of uh, 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 tumor analyses and things like that. I think the future of oncology at least in lung cancer, will continue to be to develop novel combination treatments, develop novel approaches to harness the immune system to attack cancers. I think we've seen a lot in the last uh, 10 years on anti-PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, uh, but I, I think we've hit a little bit of a plateau there, and I think we're looking forward to the next phase of, of uh, immune uh, therapies for, uh, for lung cancer, and whether that be cellular therapies or uh, T cell engagers or others or vaccines that are being tested. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, hopefully, continued screening and early detection. Um, uh, unfortunately, in in the U.S. and in many parts of the world, for patients who only the very minority of individuals who are actually eligible eligible to be screened for lung cancer undergo screening. In the U.S., it's about 5%. So there's opportunity to increase that if you can find lung cancers at an earlier stage. And same is true for other cancers, the likelihood of curing them is greater. And that can be imaging based. And there's newer technologies evolving about looking at blood based uh, screening technologies uh, that are coming out and in, in development. And so hopefully in the future, it'll be a some sort of combination of uh, imaging-based screening and blood-based screening that will tell an individual if there are if they are at risk or there's a concern for a cancer, and that will help continue to help us find cancers at an earlier stage where they're more likely to be cured. Um, thank you. And um, the last question: What do you think? Who should we interview next? I will give you uh, uh, two names of my colleagues who I think you should interview next. One is one is Tony Mock from Hong Kong, who is a uh, lung cancer expert as well and has done a lot of work in the EGFR space and other targeted therapies. And the other one is uh, Solange Peters uh, from Lausanne uh, uh, University in, in Switzerland, who is an expert on immune therapy for lung cancer and has done a lot of work on 
uh, various aspects of immune therapy for lung cancer. And both are both we're all good friends, and and uh, uh, but I think we've all fortunately been able to contribute to improving the outcomes of lung cancer patients in in in, in different but complementary ways. Thank you so much. It was a very interesting interview. Is there anything you would like to share before no, we close? No, no, just thank you for inviting me for this, and uh, I enjoyed the discussion. Thank you so much.